Thank you. Thank you all for, for coming. I'd like to thank Laura Putnam and the Polk Museum for inviting me out to do this, uh, this, this engagement, this, this, this talk. It uh, fills me with great honor to be able to do so. Uh, first and foremost, because I'm not really by any means a Chagall expert. Uh, I, I'm not an art historian, even as I am a visual artist. Um, but I always like to speak when uh, I can and on what I can uh, pertaining to uh, relevant artists from whatever uh, era or century uh, is of the moment. And uh, today is, is no uh, departure from that as Chagall is sort of, how would I say, feeding from the same sort of creative tributaries that I as an individual have and that uh, other artists that I have an interest in have, have fed from. Uh, and he is uh, very communicative, unusually powerfully communicative uh, on some specific tropes and traits that I hope I will be able to shed a little light on. I'm not so certain, but I'll certainly give it the old professorial try. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm very honored to be here, and thanks for coming out. Um, Mark Chagall, and, and we can all learn about him from handouts and what we have on the, on the walls, but he was born into one of the most buoyant and prolific eras in, uh, in art history and lived himself for the better part of a century. Just think, just think for a moment. Chagall was born a year before the titanic polemicist Friedrich Nietzsche goes mad in a public marketplace talking to a horse. <laughs> Not just saying, you know, that you'll be okay, but trying to have an entire conversation with the horse. And they found out shortly thereafter that he was stark raving mad. <laughs> Freud had just finished his perennially uh, controversial cocaine papers. <laughs> Einstein is attending grammar school in Munich, and the iconoclastic Salvador Dali is almost 20 years away from, from, from coming to the world. This is a very, very thriving and teeming time. Chagall then was active during the time when one could say America and Europe were shifting from modernism to postmodernism, that sort of difficult to pin down and elusive time in the arts, which was generously fed by the philosophical tributaries of nihilism and existentialism. We were moving, as it were, from the age of anxiety to the age of information, all fed by the industrial age, where all major paradigms were shifting from Nietzsche's blasphemous declaring of the death of God to Einstein's overtaking the New Newtonian view of time and space to living in sort of the wake of Dar Darwin's powerful suggestion that humans and lower primates share a common ancestor. What a teeming time it was then to be alive. Just got a, a, a text uh, from a friend of mine in, in Houston where I went to school for a while uh, whose mother is from the same Belarusian uh, city that Mark Chagall is from, Vitebsk. It's very sort of synchronous, right? Serendipitous that I got that text right before I, I uh, got ready to speak. And I think this would be a good time to sort of make this sort of transition into talking of music, right? Um, uh, the, 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 the lady who texted me was a, was a pianist uh, uh, on the faculty at the University of Houston where I attended. Um, and so a little bit of disclosure, I'm going to I'm going to navigate us toward a specific topic, which is Jewish mysticism, um, because that's something that's of interest to me. Aside from being uh, a cellist, I'm also a PhD student of philosophy and religion, so this is really deep passion. I don't really let it out too often, but I get to do so today. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, in full disclosure, when I left, when I left Florida and went out to Houston, well, I've been in New York. I guess I should do that one. When I went to New York to get my master's, I studied with the, the daughter of uh, then the most famous cellist, Mstislav Rostropovich, who many people believe uh, is a, a, a 
Jewish, and we sort of get to talk about that. This whole idea of we think he's Jewish is interesting, which I'll touch on. Uh, and then I came back home and went out to Houston to study with Laszlo Varga, took up with Janos Starker. These two individuals were Hungarian Jews, born in 1924. These guys are sort of in the same, you understand? These guys are in the same sort of time frame. You know, sure, Chagall is earlier, but what's going on is that you notice I mentioned Freud, Einstein, right, and, and Chagall. They were coming and, uh, into their own and doing their thing and becoming famous during a time when it was very, very interesting to be a European Jew, okay? There's a few of them we have in music as well. By the time we get to Leonard Bernstein, being a Jew in America is a party. <laughs> At least for Leonard Bernstein, for sure. Wow. But anyway, um, but for Gustav Mahler, who was also a European Jew, he had nervous breakdowns every Friday <laughs> because of the warring in him between his zeal for Christianity and his love of Judaism. It was really an interesting time. Uh, while I studied under... Laszlo Varga, I knew Zoya Shuhatovich and worked with Janos Starker. Uh, I also had many lessons with Harvey Shapiro, whose family uh, were Russian Jews. I became immersed in this ethos, became immersed in this ethos. So when I came over the other day, I, I called Laura, I said, hey, I, I know Chagall, I know his stuff, but can I come over and take a look? When I came here, all of my cello teachers came alive to me. In, 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 all, I, I, in all seriousness, uh, 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 this idea of we think Rostropovich was Jewish, there, there was a point when European Jews came to America but were under persecution, as we know our history, and would change their last names so they wouldn't be seen as Jewish. I can't pronounce Kirk Douglas's name, but it's not Kirk Douglas. <laughs> it's Isor Danilovich, actually. Yes, I can. Yeah, it's Isor Danilovich. He's a Russian Jew. Still alive. I think he's 100, right? Leonard Rose, who was the principal cellist of the New York Philharmonic for many, many years, Leonard Rose is actually Leonard Rosenberg, but he didn't want to be known as Leonard Rose. But I always wonder why he had the beautiful mane of wavy, gorgeous hair that, <laughs> that I always wish I had, <laughs> right? Uh, Janos Starker and Laszlo Varga did not wear their Judaism on their sleeve. And this is because uh, Mr. Starker uh, had to see his three brothers get mowed down by the resistance, get shot and killed. Mr. Varga was on a train with the, the yellow star on his, on his jacket that said Yudin for Jew. He was headed to be exterminated. And he tell, well, not imminently, but he's headed in the town where he was going to be exterminated. And he told the train guy, he just took a, took a chance. He goes, I need to relieve myself. I, I have to get off the train. And he said, no, you don't get that option. He goes, I'm going to soil your train if you don't let me. They let him off the train, and he ran, and he ran until he ended up in America in 1947, at which time he became the principal cellist of the New York City Opera, then the New York Philharmonic, and then several other uh, uh, first name squads. Mr. Starker came to America in 1948, became the first cellist of the Metropolitan Opera, uh, of the Chicago Symphony, the Dallas Symphony, and in 1958 became the foremost cello teacher in the world from 1958 till his death in, I believe, 2013 or so, if I'm not mistaken. He was a very close friend of mine. I say this to say that Judaism is something that flowed through the blood of these individuals, and they had to mitigate how they dealt with it in the States. Mark Chagall was very much Jewish, and he wanted his paintings to express the, the folklore and the villages that he experienced when he was a child and the turmoil of being conscripted into World War I and then the horrors that followed. He did not get away ever from his Judaism. He infuses his artwork with Judaism. Okay? His name was Moshe Chagall, however. Moshe, as in our friend Moses. It means he who is dipped from the, or dipped into the water. 
So okay, he changed it to Mark. I can, I can forgive that though. It's pretty close. But he did not shy away from expressing Jewish themes in his whole overview of his work. Um, but, but, but if we want to talk of, of mysticism, or if, not, if I am going to deign to talk of mysticism, it, we have to ask, is it appropriate, is it right, is it fitting to talk about Marc Chagall and, and mysticism? Well, as they say about William Blake, the only place to find out more about Blake is with more Blake. Let's see what we can find in a quote by Marc Chagall himself. Without the mystical element, is there a single great picture, a single great poem, or even a single great social movement? So there we have it, Marc Chagall is at home with the mystical. And how does music play in? He want, he, his next door neighbor, and he was in Vitebsk, Vitebsk when he was smaller, played the violin, and it's something that he always wanted to play. He didn't become all that good at it, but it's something that stuck with him because klezmer music which he would have grown up hearing, uh, was uh, included the clarinet and also the violin. Not only that, the violin becomes uh, a carrier for the Jewish spirit, every much as the hybridized animals, the goat for Marchagall is used, as we may know, uh, because the goat was used as a sacrificial animal uh, for Jews, uh, but also it's sort of an interlocutor, it's a way for um, uh, Marc Chagall to communicate his Judaism without having to be so in the forefront about it. So music and Marc Chagall go very much together by his own admission and also in another way. And I hope you'll come out next month. I'll be here at the gallery again on November 12th for a talk I've called Homo Synestheticus, the cosmic connection or intersection between man and the universe. And I'll speak more about it. It deals with synesthesia, which I'm going to touch on a little bit here, but I'll Leave my thunder for then. In, in the Jewish pantheon, in the Jewish ethos, are two things. Great power and great, great pain. They go together. They go together. When one, when one sees oneself as Jewish, one is able to attain that or be that through heredity and or through religious uh, choice. But if it is hereditary, it's something you never get away from. Freud and Einstein, two individuals I mentioned that were in the philosophical tributaries in which Marc Chagall found himself, were European Jews, and they're wrongly um, accused of being atheists. They're not atheists. I think it was Freud who said, well, and I paraphrase, it's not that I don't believe in God, it's just that spending my time talking about that when people are going crazy with things I can treat is a waste of time. <laughs> it's a very important thing. <laughs> Einstein, I won't go into a lot of detail, he was sort of a bad boy. Well, so I will go into it. He couldn't be faithful to his wife and didn't care about doing so. He said, I'm not, and he couldn't maintain friends. He's like, I don't really worry about all that. I'm trying to figure out how God put this together. Mm -hmm. And so you heard what he said, how God put it together. He indeed said, uh, like, for, like for us, not that I don't believe, it's that, I mean, when I'm thinking of the expanse of the cosmos, mm -hmm. there's starlight you can see. Writing, you know, tomes on that which you can't all the time seems a little counterintuitive. And I would dare say, and this is a dicey statement, if they had, if they had been atheists, there's no more interesting a flavor of atheism than Jewish atheism. I just went out on a limb, but I had a patron who was an atheistic Jew, and I don't even know if, here's, let me say this. A former student of mine, terribly brilliant, considers himself an absurdist. Of course, I didn't even know what that meant, and I teach a class on the absurd, but, you know, <laughs> how absurd. But mm, because of some criticism he had, and 
I decided to invite him out to lunch. And I said, what is an absurdist? And he said, basically, basically one who, who embraces the pointlessness of all existence. Okay, so we talked a little bit. So then he got interested in Jewish, in Kabbalah. And to talk about it, he would put on his yarmulke. I said, time, you're an atheist. Why are you putting on a yarmulke? He's like, well, I mean, I'm like, no, I don't know. I don't know what you mean. What do, why are you putting on the yarmulke? He's like, well, it's all theater. I said, well, talk to me about that. <laughs> he said, well, Jews have always known there was no God. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> and remember, this is my mate. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, they always have. I'm like, <laughs> um, the, ten, <laughs> the Ten Commandments, uh, Moses and Aaron, Moses with the serpent, all of this history that they're so proud of, they didn't believe there's, he goes, no. I said, okay, so I deal with archetypes. So the archetype closest to the mind is that which represents that which cannot be gotten to by the mind, the imminent and the transcendent. In my world, yeah, the, the gods you can get to might be the archetype, but it implies that there's something you can get to. I said, are you telling me there's an archetype and there's nothing to get to? He goes, absolutely. I said, oh my, you're blowing my mind. So let me say this again. You're telling me the archetype that they, so you admit they pray to, go, oh yeah, there's a bunch of theater. They pray to it and everything, have a wailing wall. But, and I said, but they don't believe that there's an archetype? He goes, absolutely not. I was floored for about 12 hours. <laughs> then he came over and hung out in my sort of mystical studies thing I have at my house. And within two weeks, he believed in God. So there goes that. <laughs> Hanging out with me will do some damage. But in, but in any event, yeah, I mentioned that Jewish atheism is an interesting type of atheism. So, the way I like to say it is, there's something we can't get to. It's called God. Can't get to it. So, we're going to get to something that we can. It's called God. That's how it works. And so, yeah, being a Jewish atheist is a, is a stretch. I'm not sure if my Jewish atheist friends were even Jew. I, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. But I know that Mark Chagall was not. When he was under the most stress, this is when the archetypal languages came out. Let me, let me introduce us to this next phase of my lecture. Mark Chagall said that as he was coming up in his hometown town of Vitebsk, he not only saw the Jewish synagogues, but also the Christian monasteries, and they made indelible impressions upon his mind. I'd like to play for you um, the adagio from the organ toccata in C by Johann Sebastian Bach. I'm trying to think if I should tell you why, before, I'll tell you after. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you. Now, of course, we come to the why I played that. Johann Sebastian Bach, as I say, was probably the most passionate Christian since Jesus Christ. <laughs> he, was a, he was a Christian mystic. He was a numerologist. He had eidetic imagery, which means photographic memory and total recall. Uh, his music represents... Laws of physics can be discovered in his music. The golden disc, which NASA sent out in either 69 or 71, which circles in, in the heavens, has the music of Bach on it, just in case intelligent life is ever discovered. They wanted uh, them to hear the greatest things we could produce, and there's a statement of Einstein's theory of relativity, John F. Kennedy, and the music of Bach. Uh, Bach was essentially Pythagorean, he believed that the universe was put together a certain way and that B flat being here and A being here represented how the universe was put together. And I tell you, he's pretty convincing. It's not hot to be a Pythagorean or a, uh, a rationalist. Well, let me say this. It's not hot to be a Pythagorean in 2018, but he was this titanic genius. He just wrote this piece for Oregon, but Bach never, <laughs> Bach never just writes a piece. There's a story to be told, but unlike paintings, you're not going to, well, you can see it, but it travels with the notes. That piece was written in A minor, which, and I have perfect pictures where I have identical image, which is essentially the most painful key there is. It's painful. You, you felt it? I see people, I see, when I have played this, what I try to get in my mind, people, when you think of the uh, picture of the crucifixion, which he did a wonderful crucifixion, but people usually think of being at the feet of Jesus and looking up at him suffering. I play that from the opposite point of view. I'm looking through Christ's eyes as he's dying. And so he's alternatingly going through horrible pain as he's being beneficent to those who put him in the situation. So he's going from realm to realm, from plane to plane, pain to what we call eudaimonia, meaning the higher self, and then ultimately at the end, to death. This, this, this pain is found in the Jewish ethos. And it's oddly celebrated. A composer by the name of Ernest Bloch writes a piece called, well, Shalomo, Solomon. The, and it's for cello solo and orchestra in the opening, well, when the cello plays this theme, it goes. Right? Vanity, it is empty. It, the opening of Ecclesiastes is what he's saying. Ernest Bloch was a Jewish composer. What I'm setting up is, when I look at these paintings, or when you look at them, one thing you will find that is missing is any outburst of very, very bright colors. They're all muted and pastels, no? There are bright colors there, but they're not presented brightly. Uh, Let's take one, let's take a painting. Um, let me just point out why I'm doing, so I love the fact that when, 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 when Chagall paints Moses, he always paints him as if he looks like he has horns. He always does, I mean, he's over there. You can always tell where Moses is because he's got the horns going on. There he is with the serpent and, 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 and the, the staff, which I'll talk about. And I'm glad to see in this exhibit something that took me a while to find out. I remember when I was at Polk State as a student, I discovered for the first time in my life Michelangelo's sculpture of Moses in Italy, and I noticed he had horns. I'm like, wait, wait a minute now. Someone very important in the Jewish lineage, the patriarch of the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims, right, uh, Musa for Arabs, has horns. So I went to my humanities teacher, I'm like, I'm sorry, why does, uh, why does Moses have horns? And the strangest answer came back. Three words, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, well, now we have a 
over 600 year old statue of a very important person and you don't know why he has horns. <laughs> yeah, that, that. So I went and did research and found out what you can see. I was glad to see this. I don't find this explanation here and it is, it's on this wall. I forget which wall it's on. It's very simple. Jacopo Tintoretto, the early uh, Italian painter, paints Moses with uh, uh, rays of fire or rays of light coming from each side of his temple. He also gives him horns. And it's because the Hebrew word for halo means the same as horn. Ta-da! It's all you got to do. How my teacher didn't know, I'll never know. But anyway, yes, I'm, I'm glad to see that, 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 that Chagall uses this. But here, you know, we have Moses presenting, you know, he's with the Ten Commandments. So there's all this gray around him. There's the menorah, which is very important. There's the Jewish people. But again, I say to you, there's all this gray around Moses. Because even he has, an, uh, how would you say, uh, uh, an interesting end to his campaign. How about that? His people get to go to the promised land, but he doesn't. That's a painful end. It's a painful end. And I would submit the argument that everyone in the Old Testament has a painful life. Everybody. Uh, it gets interesting when it becomes Judeo-Christianity. Then it becomes a little Epcotty, um, you know, because you get the Apostle Paul to, to, to do some, some PR work and it becomes, you know, becomes a little Disneyfied. But even there, if you really dig deep, it really isn't Epcot or Disney. It's just the, 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 how do you say? The phrases which let you into the bigger picture are very short. They're aphoristic. You have to unpack them. So the light that we have in, in Moses with the Ten Commandments in this presentation is from the menorah and from his halo, meaning he's enlightened. But what he has to do is an awesome task. He's charged with leading the Israelites out of Egypt, which is called the name of these uh, paintings collectively, the Exodus, the exit, the exeunt. We have a thing in music called tone colors. I can play A any number of ways, right? This is A. <laughs> I haven't changed the note, I haven't changed the pitch. I've changed the dynamic, but I've also changed what we call the color of the note. It was, uh, 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 it was Goethe who said, architecture is frozen music. There's crossover here. There's great music coming from these paintings, great music coming from these paintings. But I would dare say that it's a dark music. The Kol Nidre, eh? that the Jewish cantor sings in the synagogue. Just the opening. the great pain of the, from these expresses this minor third in the same key this way. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So I told you there's great, great power, great, great mm, responsibility, but also great pain. Right? So there's this uh, ambivalence, this, 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 this vacillation between almost uh, polar opposites that also happens in the Col Nidre. It happened here in the Bach. You had the minor opening, and then all of a sudden it had these wonderful, well, I don't know about wonderful, but interesting colors, but they never became bright. You, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, uh, so, so let me remind you. So, right. So we have. Get my music together here. Let's see where is it. Ah, there we are. So again, the opening, right? piece goes like this. Mm. As happy as you can be. It's really joyous. But you do know what happens when you have alternating happiness and sadness, right? It defaults to unhappiness, doesn't it? Because you can't always have happiness. And thus I bring you Marc Chagall. And I don't want to make it light because this is anything but. Okay, so I'm not gonna walk, so where is it? You see this painting over here to your left and my right. Well, I said I wasn't gonna walk and now I'm doing it because I want to get the name, right? So yeah, it's, uh, God turns Moses' staff into a serpent. And please affiliate yourselves with the, the fables of La Fontaine, which are wonderful illustrations of uh, La Fontaine's uh, 1688 or so uh, fables. But again, my thing is mysticism. <laughs> so I'd like to stay in my wheelhouse. There is a lot being communicated in that painting, at least to me. And it's interesting because I just got through lecturing about this to my classes for about two weeks. I usually, I usually do uh, the patriarchs of, of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in about two days, and just something got a hold of me. I spent two weeks on it. And that's just, it just happens. And I just got through dealing with Moses and uh, uh, the burning bush, which is also there, and the serpent. There's a whole backstory, well, and we know the backstory, but there's a mystical backstory to the whole Moses and the serpent, or Moses and the burning bush uh, events. And here, what we see is an interesting uh, 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 depiction of Moses almost in the ta-da stance, right? Because this, this, it's a staff which he's carried around, which he turns, uh, puts on the water, turns into blood, right? He puts on the water, he opens the Red Sea. Well, here, he's just having the staff turn into a serpent. But that ta-da moment 
is amazing. And this shows me that Chagall is in touch with the mystical side of his faith, of his religion. And that is the Latin term for what Moses would be, one of them, is ma magister. If, it, if there were a bunch, there were, they would be magi, magi. And all you do is add a couple uh, letters and you have magician. But it is not in the denigrated, connotated, or even bastardized form of the word. One, I, I have a pocket watch that says Artia Magister. It means master of the arts. It's my pocket, it's me, right? You, you are a master of something. The reason Moses is one of the most important patriarchs for the Judaic people is because of his great uh, experience with what uh, uh, is called the numinous. Mysterium tremendum et fascinans, the great mystery and terrible to behold. A face to face confrontation, Jung would say, with God. That's Moses, right? So what is going on is that Moses' people are in uh, Egypt uh, uh, in captivity, being tormented by the Egyptians who speak a language which is symbolized by staves and serpents. When you get headdresses of some of the old pharaohs at the third eye level, there are serpents which come out this way. For many Africans, the gecko, because his eyes can unlock and go into different quadrants, represents wisdom. The serpent is an interesting creature. For the Chinese, if you have a winged serpent, uh, uh, you, have, you have a dragon. That's not necessarily negative for them. The dragon or the winged serpent becomes somewhat amorphous and uh, foreboding for Westerners who co-opt Mid-Eastern points of view. And here we have Moses with the serpent. The serpent, for a lot of ancient cultures, represents creative energy. For the Hindus, it's a female called Kundalini. And she's wrapped around the spine three and one half times. That symbolism may just be what we find in the book of Genesis where the serpent is talking to Adam and Eve. There's a tree, which for the ancients represents the spine, and then there's a serpent whose, whose punishment is to go on its stomach, so it couldn't have been on its stomach to begin with. So there's those who believe that it's standing up and has wings, which is interestingly also an ancient symbol for genius, which is the singular of genie or jinn, twin spirits. So when, when we're talking about the Egyptians, Communicating with staves and serpents, in mystical speak, that is them attaining different planes of consciousness. But Moses, Moshe, he who was dipped into the water, his archetypal story tells us he has parents on two sides of a body of water. He gets dipped in the water and is raised by Egyptians, but is he truly Egyptian? The point is, he is a polyglot. He can speak both languages. So... He's able to bring his serpent as well. The Tada moment shows that God, or the angel of God, which is right there animating Moses, is the one that's making the serpent or the staff turn into a serpent. But at the lateral level, the other humans don't see God, they just see Moses, which is why he seems like he's going ta-da. The other thing before I take some questions is that Moses raising the serpent is mystical speak for he is a highly enlightened individual. Uh, I think it's in, I can't remember what, but it's in the New Testament when Jesus says, and when the Son of Man is raised in the desert, is, when the Son of Man has been raised on high, as Moses raised the serpent in the desert, then you will know I am he. Raising the serpent in the desert is mystical speak for becoming enlightened, opening up your chakras, up the spine, and letting kundalini go all the way up so that you're enlightened, which would be symbolized by a halo coming out of the top of your head vis-a-vis -vis the horns. Now, um, is, am I correct about that? Well, Moshe Chagall's not here to argue with me, so I don't know. But I, I, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with it. 
Um, so much more I could speak of. The burning bush, it's, it, that's a theophany. Was it really a, there's a statement, the bush says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. That is, that is, that is mystical speak for become circumcised so we can have this very Jewish conversation. The, the conversation was going on here. The burning bush, a bush, the menorah, the tree of life, right? Burning but not consumed, which is a symbol of genius, which Moses was. So much more stuff I could say. But let me take some questions. Let me take some questions if any of you have any. Yes.